on terror dominates South Florida attention. We are seeing an increase in reported threats against faith communities. And its response. This is Israel's 9-11 and it should be acted on accordingly. Our mission would be to go over there and backfill their fire stations or assist them in the hospitals. It's natural to ask, why does this matter to America? National drama with a Florida focus. We'll never yield to threats and intimidation. South Florida moves in the House, in the White House. This role is incredibly meaningful to me. And at the hospital in Gaza. And they're just looking at numbers on pieces of paper up there. More efficient Florida courts or more political control? The work to decide is underway. The big news of the week from all the local angles, all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg, South Florida. Once again, we are immersed locally in the most significant national and international news of the week. And in the next half hour, we will hear from those immersed in it. Those immersed in getting aid to Israel, ramping up the operation to root out terrorists, those orchestrating relief for civilians in Gaza, those deciding the political moves that chart the history we are now all experiencing together all from South Florida. And we begin with Congressman Mario diaz Balart, Republican from Miami, here with us today live. Good morning, Congressman. Good to see you, Glenn. Thank you. Good to see you, too. And I'm, uh, I'm really glad that you're here today because you are the chair for the appropriations portion of the State Department and the foreign governmental spending. And what a week for you. Also about the speaker and the search for, so we'll get to all of that in the next couple of minutes, but I really do want to start with the, this week, the president proposed spending, uh, a big package of spending for Ukraine and for Israel and for humanitarian uh, assets and also for the southern border. So I wanted to, for your constituents today, get your take on whether you support that or not. Well, I'm still reviewing the details. I'll tell you it's a bit of a sticker shock. It's over $100 billion. I will tell you that we have to make sure that Israel has everything, and I mean that, everything that it needs uh, to take care of the situation that it is now facing. It is going to have to deal with these terrorists in a very aggressive way, and I support Israel um, doing what it needs to do. By the way, and it might get ugly. It will get ugly. War is ugly, particularly when you're dealing with terrorists. But I support Israel doing what it needs to do. And so uh, the portion for Israel, uh, uh, I'm looking through it. It looks uh, to be what Israel is actually asking for. We are in touch with the Israeli go uh, government almost on a, on a constant basis. Uh, I support defeating Putin. Uh, the, the problem uh, that we're having uh, with this proposal, it is not very clear. A big chunk of the money, by the way, that it says it is for um, for Ukraine is not for Ukraine. It's actually for us, the United States, to to uh, to make up the gap for armaments that have been already sent abroad. Uh, we need to do that uh, on the border. You also mentioned um, border is not just money. It's policy. Uh, I will tell you, Glenna, that if anybody thought that uh, we were going to be able to have this disastrous border situation without consequences. Um, I think we're sitting on a ticking time bomb because of the grotesque irresponsibility of this administration uh, to protect the, the southern border and to actually give to the, the, the control of the southern border to the narco cartels. So uh, we're looking through it. We need to make sure that we provide Israel everything, everything it needs. And this is going to be a long drawn out a uh, painful process. It might take days, weeks, or months. However long it takes, I will be supporting Israel's right to defend itself. You know, I, as you say that, and you have so much support, Israel has so much support, the civilians on both sides of that border have so much support. So I wonder, as we sit and watch not only the humanitarian aid start to arrive uh, in, in what is a significant but a trickle to the Gaza border for them, what do you tell your constituents about how far you would like to see the U.S. military involved as our warships are in place as we speak, and also how you find that balance between Israel rooting out terrorists once and for all and protecting its civilians and the civilians in Gaza who are paying the price for that operation? 
Yeah, on, on, we have to make sure that, uh, again, no other country tries to use this opportunity to, uh, again, further go after Israel. Uh, and I think that is very, very important that the world understands that we stand with Israel. That's point number two. On the issue of the civilians, number one is I am going to listen to what the Israelis think needs to be done. On the issue of, of aid to, uh, to Gaza, I am going to listen to the Israelis as to what they think needs to be done and how it should be done. They are there. They're the ones who are dealing with this. You know, I'm reminded, uh, um, and I don't know if it's a good comparison, and I don't exactly remember all the numbers, but there are about 20,000 uh, buried dead German Nazi soldiers, German soldiers uh, in uh, the area when the United States and its allies started liberating France. But, but there were also about 20,000 French civilians, and I'm talking about the Normandy area, that were killed by the, the, the allies in the bombing raids in order to liberate uh, that part of France alone. Why do I say that? Because it's ugly, war is horrible. This was brought on by Hamas, by the terrorists. And now Israel has to do whatever it deems necessary to protect its citizens, to protect itself. This is an existential threat to Israel. And that's why I, I will repeat it time and time again, even when we start seeing things that we're not gonna like. I will stand with Israel. Israel needs to do what it needs to do, and I will stand with Israel to the end. So many comparisons we've been hearing about current state of affairs and World War II over and over. Congressman, as you know, as we know, nothing gets done until that speaker is seated, and um, the people in the process are riveted all week to watching the vote go down. Once again, Florida in the middle of everything, you and your colleague, Carlos Jimenez, Republican from Miami, you were kind of half of the holdouts that started the domino effect of Jim Jordan not getting the votes. Uh, you were behind Steve Scalise for a couple of votes. And now late Friday night, it looks like you're now supporting Florida Congressman Byron Donalds for speaker. What do you expect to happen this week? Can anybody get to 217 and without that, no aid, no support, no policy gets done? Yeah, we have to get this done. Remember, we are in this situation because eight small group, eight Republicans, uh, who actually then coalesced uh, and coordinated with, with the radical left in the House, the squad. And eventually they got all the Democrats to join them to, in essence, depose the Republican uh, speaker, which has frankly never been done before. Now, I will tell you well, what now, happened. Wait a we second. That's who, what Democrat would vote for a Republican speaker? What Republican would vote for a Democrat speaker? That's kind of. No, I know. But what I'm telling you, the reason we are here is because this small group of eight Republicans, again, uh, got together with the Democrats to do this. That's why we are in the situation that we are at. Uh, and I think that's, uh, as you know, that's a factual statement. Now, we had an, we had an election and that election against two individuals, uh, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise won and then immediately uh, they started trying to undermine the election that Mr. Scalise had actually won. Uh, and he did the honorable thing because of, of the pressure tactics started to try to undermine who actually won the election. He did the honorable thing uh, and, and he decided to allow the process to move forward. But I will tell you in my situation, I will never yield to pressure or to attempts to intimidate me. Now, conversations, all of that is great and you know, and tough conversations. But as soon as this starts of trying to intimidate or trying to, you know, kind of scare people to vote one way or another, uh, that's where I will never even I won't contemplate that. I mean, you know, those tactics of trying to intimidate has the opposite effect of me. I will not be intimidated. Now, were you, were you one we, of the people? Were you one of the people, one of the congressmen or women who received death threats from those people uh, who wanted you to vote for Jim Jordan? Were you one of those? Did you get well, those threats? Without getting into, without getting into details, it was it, it got pretty ugly, uh, and that's unfortunate. And that is not something that, that we can tolerate. I will never tolerate that. I have very tough conversations with anybody, and I will speak and negotiate with anybody. But the the, the moment that you try to start intimidating me, sorry, that's just never gonna work. If you want somebody, if, if, the, if my constituents and the voters want somebody that can be intimidated, well, they got the wrong person. And I think they all know that. And so now we have to elect a speaker. I think we have a really good group of uh, folks who are running. I think any one of them, by the way, could get 217 votes on the floor, assuming that this very small group of eight that are the ones that brought us to this situation in the first place, uh, decide to become part of the team again. 
Well, we will all be watching Riveted on all of those levels. Um, always great to have you on board the program. Congressman Mario diaz Villar. have a beautiful Sunday. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks so much. And next, the more local legal as South Florida city and county lawmakers plan support and money to terror victims. More importantly, it's people that have a need and, um, and there's a way that we can help. Emotion turns to action. South Florida cities and counties this week looked for logistical ways to support victims of terror, from sending first responders to sending money and investments, resolutions and support, and addressing a growing call from those who oppose those efforts. Broward County Commissioner Michael Udeen has been among the most vocal, and he is right here at the table with us today. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Of course. So you at the last commission meeting and a number of your colleagues were all pretty much in unison. There was a resolution condemning the terror attack by Hamas. There was support for Israel's right to defend itself. There was uh, an uh, urging federal emergency assistance, all that kind of came into play. Um, what What is your message to not only a very huge Jewish and Israeli community in South Florida, but also a huge, significant Muslim, Islamic, uh, Palestinian population who is watching this unfold with their own sense of grief and terror. Well, no one wants to see babies and innocent people get mutilated and slaughtered. So I think everyone shares that same common belief and understanding and value. But the point is, Israel was attacked in the most massive attack, the most massive loss of lives uh, barbarism and and just total terror it was the largest thing since the Holocaust and that's something that must be responded to it must be responded to forcefully by Israel and Israel must defend itself and must rid itself of this terror thing which is right on its border I mean think about you know a border between Miami-Dade and Broward or between New York and New Jersey whatever it is put that in perspective you cannot have terrorists whose lives under a stated goal of wiping you off the map and be able to survive peacefully with that when you're getting attacked on Simchat Torah, on Shabbat, on some of the most holiest days in the Israeli calendar. And it's just not something that normal people can put up with. Is So at the last commission meeting, the uh, there was a vote to increase investments in Israel bonds. I Israel bonds is an investment. I think that South Florida communities, many of them have invested in already. Tell me, tell me about that decision. So we didn't have that vote at the meeting. We had already had that as a policy. So Broward County, in part of their investment portfolio, does has, have Israel bonds in their portfolio. We, our county administrator, I've spoken with her about that. They're looking to increase that balance as these bonds come due and as there's more opportunity to purchase them, as are many other communities throughout the state. And I spoke with my finance director in Broward County who told me that the demand is through the roof for these, which is a good thing. So it gives the Israelis um, you know, m some financial stability as they move forward with doing what they have to do. And it is, it is a good investment, you feel, for Broward County. It's a great investment. These bonds have never lost money for the county. They do better than most of the other treasury type investments that we were making. So taxpayers' money is safe there and it's part of our investment portfolio. So let's bring it back sort of on the ground level. What you're hearing from constituents, I'm sure, about a lot of things and you're seeing uh, an increasing number of rallies, huge rallies by very angry, grief-filled people uh, talking about a more political type of message than a terrorist type of message. People who sees Israel's response into Gaza and fear for civilians and feel like uh, there is a, they're, they're sort of bringing in the political point of view of a decades-old dispute into this terrorist act. How do you, what is your message about that? Well, the first thing is when I'm seeing these rallies and when people are hearing these rallies, we're not hearing for the call to get hostages released. We're not hearing for the condemnation of what happened on October 7th. We're not hearing for what, you know, the, the terror that was inflicted, for the barbarism, for people, you know, being burned alive. What we're hearing is now we all of a sudden we need a ceasefire. How would we have felt after 9-11 if we heard this, if they were marching on the streets in New York calling for the U.S. to do nothing? We still have in Israel 
and American hostages being held by Hamas. That needs to be dealt with and dealt with forcefully, in my opinion. Um, Broward County, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, we're home to a very, very large Jewish population. Um, but this goes beyond the Jewish population. This is a humanity population. I mean, barbarism cannot be allowed to stand. So I get it. Everyone has the peaceful right to protest, but we're seeing that these some of these protests are going way beyond that, calling for death to Jews, death to Israelis, wiping Israel off the map. I don't think that's something that we can put up with as, you know, normal human beings. We, we actually are looking at some of the video that our crews took some of uh, during the weekend. I believe this was the weekend. Um, so this comes down to, you know, this is such an intractable kind of back and forth because you keep thinking of the people who have nothing to do with anything being so victimized by the current status of everything. Um, and so what I think of is, is I bring it down sort of an educational point of view. I know that the state attorney was in front of the commission talking about a hate crimes unit. I know now this week there's something on the Broward agenda about allocating money for AJC for anti-Semitism training to spot it, to root it out. And, and I wonder if you would add it like an anti Islamophobia, Islamophobia component to that because because hate is hate is hate, and we and we are seeing that in our community. Absolutely, there should be Islamophobia should be condemned the same as any other form of hate. People need to learn to live together, to respect each other's views. The AGC thing, uh, the AJC th issue that we had on our agenda. American this was, Jewish Mar Committee. Yeah, American Jewish have, Committee. Yeah, yes, no, I know. Name. We had funded some dollars in the last budget cycle, and this will put that into place so that we can do that. Again, we're the home to a very large Jewish population. El Al, Israel's national carrier, is headquartered for their U.S. in Broward County. Um, so we want to do what we can. We want people to peacefully coexist with each other. But I think, you know, Normal people, when they turn their TV on on a Saturday or Sunday morning, don't want to see terrorism and they don't want to see people being butchered alive. You, um, at the last meeting, there was a report that you walked out during uh, public speaking. Uh, we didn't, I went to look. I didn't see that on the, on the camera. Did you walk out and I, why? Um, I thought that after we did our resolution, um, I thought that to have somebody come up and not mention the what went on two days before in Israel, to, to just immediately go into ceasefire and this was Israel's fault and, you know, the Palestinians are the ones that need to be protected, was just not something I was interested in hearing at that time. So, you know, I turned my back on it and, you know, walked out. Senator Geller did the same thing. And the other people on the dais were equally as disgusted, I believe, by what they were hearing. Again, peaceful protest, fine. Talking about issues, fine. But when you don't condemn, let's, let's make the comment first. Send back all the hostages. Release Americans and Israelis that are being held. And then they can have peaceful d demonstrations. But what we're seeing going on now on college campuses, throughout the nation, what this is is something that's just deplorable to so many people on so many levels. Commissioner Michael Udeen, great to have you aboard today. Thank you. We'll be watching this week. Thank you. Take care. All right. All right, from South Florida to D.C. and the local connection in the White House to the whole U.S. Jewish community. She's live with us next. There is a South Florida connection to the Al Ali Hospital in Gaza, where a blast this week killed hundreds. Evidence points to a failed exploding rocket launch by Palestinian Islamic Jihad falling on Gazans taking shelter at that hospital. Our South Florida connection to this is Bishop Gregory Rickle, who is board chair of American Friends of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem that supports the hospital. He's in D.C. at the moment on his way back to home in Fort Lauderdale. Bishop, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really great to have your perspective as somebody who is so involved in caring for that hospital. And first, please do tell us if you have been in touch with the staff and administrators and the people who were there and how are they doing? Yes, in fact, uh, what I'm doing in DC is we had our uh, board meeting here and Friday we did, we were able to Zoom with the Archbishop who oversees the hospital and is uh, oversees that diocese uh, in the Middle East. And he was able to reach uh, Suhaila, who's our uh, director of the hospital, 
Uh, what we found out Friday was that most of our staff uh, made it through the blast. Uh, I think uh, the press is well aware the blast hit the courtyard of the hospital. And when you look at the uh, footage, you'll see that uh, it, it torched a lot of vehicles and it, it, we believe it killed about 200 people that were in the courtyard. Most of them seeking safety, uh, believing the hospital would be a safe place to be, but the staff uh, is in pretty good shape. The hospital itself, the infrastructure, the walls, seem to be uh, okay. We, of course, have not been able to verify that there's not damage uh, in that that we cannot see. All the windows are blown out. Uh, there is a an Orthodox church about 200 meters right behind the hospital that was directly hit about two days after this blast while worshipers were present. 19 were killed. Uh, and our director actually opened the hospital especially the operating theaters, because the injured from that blast uh, were could not be accepted in any other hospital in Gaza at the moment. So they're operating uh, to a limited degree without uh, windows and without a lot of supplies. Uh, I don't think this has happened at Ali Era, but we are getting reports that inside Gaza that operations that are being done, some of them are being done without anesthesia now. We had so, we had actually heard those same reports and an unimaginable humanitarian crisis uh, unfolding there as we speak. Um, there was originally, Bishop, the news that day of that horrendous explosion in the courtyard of the hospital uh, originally and right away was uh, blamed on the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, that we've come to learn is is likely not true that it was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad failed rocket that did all that damage. Uh, that does not seem to change the narrative, though, of people who are very angry at the Israeli operation to root out terrorists. Can you give us your reaction to that? Well, uh, I visited the hospital in 2016. I think it's uh, I, I don't even want to wade in on uh, you know, where the rocket came from. I think it's highly possible that that is true. We haven't verified either way. And to some degree, uh, for us anyway, in our work, the point is that this war has caused this no matter what rocket hit the hospital. And uh, our focus is humanitarian relief and trying to, uh, in every way we can, help the innocents survive <clears throat> this current war. So uh, we don't know that for sure. We we do know, uh, you know, with some verification that there was uh, one nearby that hit and it uh, it did some damage to the cancer wing of uh, Ali Arab. It's a small wing, uh, it's a mammography unit. Uh, but other than that, we do not know. And and as I said, our our focus is not on how it happened, but that it is happening. And that we, you know, we want to help the innocents in every way we can and try to help civilians and get people out of harm's way. Understood. And the Al-Ali Hospital, we've come to learn, is the oldest hospital in Gaza. It is a kind of a, an historic site and it is the only Arab Christian hospital in Gaza. Is there or is it too soon to even think about how to repair and restore and reopen and continue serving or is that just not something you can think about no. until this war comes to some no conclusion? absolutely not no we're one reason we spent a lot of our time here in dc talking about just that and we have uh we have received uh, very generous donations and we're continuing to work on that and our focus now is on when it's possible because you are correct we cannot start that now until we know what happens with this, but the plans are already being made. And the amazing heroes, the staff that works there, uh, Suhaila, when we had her on the phone, she's been there 30 plus years. Uh, she has a U.S. passport. She could actually leave Gaza anytime she wants. She's chosen to stay with her people. She is one of the amazing heroes. Uh, she said, we plan, she, she used the word hope, and she said, we plan to come back stronger than we were even before. And so, yes, we're focused on that, but of course, that cannot begin until we know uh, <clears throat> what happens with this war. 
I see on the website that you are planning or were planning a mission to the Holy Land in January. Is that still on? Still on at the moment. <clears throat> the way we do that is uh, basically I'm going unless the airlines don't go, which uh, that is that is the present state that they're not flying there. But if they do fly there and if the State Department uh, doesn't put a do not fly order uh, or our operators on the ground say they can't safely provide it, we will go. Now, of course, there was never a hope uh, on this trip that I would get into Gaza. Uh, I haven't been able <clears throat> to get a permit to get back to Gaza since 2016. So that was never a plan. But to be with the Archbishop and to, to visit some of our other institutions, because our organization oversees about 30 institutions in the West Bank, in Israel, and in uh, Gaza. <clears throat> Bishop Gregory Rickle, uh, really nice to have you on the show. You are our South Florida connection to what is going on, and I hope you will keep in touch with us. Absolutely, I really appreciate it and would love to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And coming up next, we go back to D.C. and the White House's liaison to the entire Jewish community with a South Florida twist. The political and the personal, that is the line many in South Florida find themselves writing, struggling with the terror attack, Israel's war on Hamas, the fate of the hostages, the involvement of the U.S., and one of the people immersed in that melding role is the White House's liaison to the Jewish community, and she is from South Florida, born, raised, and schooled right here. Shelly Greenspan is with us live from D.C., and full disclosure for the record, Shelly's family in South Florida does include her mama, who is a longtime employee in the Local 10 family. That said, Shelly, it's so much fun to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Glenna. So you have been in this position a little over a year. Boy, this must have been a changing role for you these couple of weeks. Please tell us about that. Yeah, first, I mean, really, thank you so much for having me. Um, look, I'm in D.C. right now, but South Florida raised me. Um, like you said, I grew up going to Channel 10 with my mom. Um, I've seen the rallies at Hillel, my Jewish day school that I grew up going to. I've seen the rallies at Beth Shalom. Um, I know the community organized that's taking place at Bose, where my dad is probably having breakfast right now. This situation is not only heartbreaking and terrifying, but it's also so personal to me and so many of those, especially the South Florida community. And, you know, my heart goes out to everyone. And if I can just send one message is that pre President Biden has your back and we are focused on this nonstop. Well, since you bring up the president, I know in the past couple of weeks you have you have been in the room where it happens, and that must be um, a, a pretty significant thing for you to be. You are not a policymaker, and yet you are out there kind of doing a shuttle diplomacy role, really, it sounds like, a diplomat, um, and bringing back messages to the White House. Share with us what you have advised or suggested or let the White House know about what you're finding in the community. Yeah, look, I've, I've always taken my job as serving as the bridge between the American Jewish community and the administration very seriously. It's a it's a responsibility that I'm honored to take on. Obviously, in the past two weeks, those responsibilities have been heightened. People are afraid right now. Um, like I said, this is very personal. There are um, individuals with loved ones who are taken hostage or passed away and killed because of the terrorist attacks in Israel. And I've relayed all those concerns about growing anti-Semitism here domestically as well to the administration. And I mean, there's no one more pro-Israel or who cares more about the Jewish community than President Biden. And, you know, if I can speak from my personal perspective, you know, this is a hard time for all of us right now. Um, and I would say the only thing that's really giving me hope is the resiliency and the strength of the Jewish community and also President Biden, his moral clarity and his commitment to Israel, which is nothing new. I mean, you know, this just... I think last week was his 11th time traveling to Israel, and it's the first time a president ever traveled to Israel during a time of war, which I think just speaks volumes to his commitment to the state of Israel, to the Jewish people. Um, and so my role and my responsibility as serving as that bridge has become increasingly more important during these past few weeks. The president also said this week uh, something along the lines of, 
do th these were not his words but what his uh, message was was don't react from emotion uh, don't use your rage did that resonate with you at all I mean I think if you're talking about his message of deterrence he's pretty much made that clear he, he's underscored a crystal clear message that any actor non-state or state actor trying to take advantage of this conflict between Israel and Hamas you know his clear message is don't and I think that's why you've seen um, him deploying two aircraft carriers to the region and other military assets to the region. Um, so he's been crystal clear in that message of deterrence. You know, you know that the American Jewish community is by no means monolithic. It is very diverse, a lot of diverse uh, thoughts, opinions, perspectives. And what we've hear, heard and seen in the past week is not only horror and outrage to this terror attack, but we've also seen a significant number of people in the Jewish community call for a ceasefire and to protect the civilians in Gaza. And I wonder if you have had any firsthand conversations with people who are not behind an all-out war to root out Hamas and, and how you address that. You know, I will say, you know, President Biden has made it really clear that we mourn every single loss of innocent life. And he's very much concerned about making sure that we send humanitarian assistance to Gaza right now. He's made it clear that you know, the terrorist organization of Hamas does not stand for the Palestinian people. And I think you'll probably continue to see that in his messaging. Um, but he's also made it clear that it's his first order of business that you know Israel does have the right to self-defense, especially against a terrorist organization like Hamas. And I think that's why you know he did travel to Israel during a time of war to make that very clear, you know, I think, you know, you've heard him say so many times, I stand with Israel, but he wanted to actually be standing in Israel when he sent that message. Yeah, um, and, and I want to I want to kind of hear and I want our viewers to hear uh, from you personally what you're experiencing when you hear these diverse voices and how how as a diplomat for the White House, you handle those, especially in the Jewish community who may not agree. Look, uh, disagreement in the Jewish community is nothing new. Um, I've been in this job now for over a year, and it's something that I embrace. I think diversity in the Jewish community is something that we should all be really proud of, and people come at this from different sides. Um, all I can share is where the president is right now, and um, I don't want to get ahead of anything that he has said or anything where um, the administration is or isn't. Um, you know, we listen to everyone, and you know that is, I think, the beauty of our democracy. Um, and I very much embrace the diversity of opinions within our Jewish community, um, especially you know, within the building of the White House. And we encourage um, everyone to share their perspectives. But at the end of the day, the president is, is the one who sets the policy and we stand behind that. And, and you work at the moment for a Democratic White House. There is an enormous Republican Jewish community who might have very different views. Do you, do you bring any messages back and sort of play that diplomat at the White House and suggest and advise and uh, with the messages you're receiving from the other side of the aisle. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is a lot of unity in the Jewish community right now, and you're probably seeing it in South Florida as well. People really putting aside their political differences to support the state of Israel and support the U.S. Israel relationship, support the Jewish community right now, and it's been beautiful. Um, just this past week, we had um, a group of Orthodox Jewish Day School students come from New York and they dropped off 18,000 individual handwritten letters thanking President Biden for his support of Israel. And they came to DC, they traveled five hours by bus just to drop off this, these letters. And they come from families you know, across the political spectrum. Um, and I think it's really a time that we need this unity right now because the most important thing is support for Israel and making sure the US-Israel relationship is as strong as possible. And it, it's been very heartening to see individuals, Democrats, Republicans, independents come together um, and make that message really clear. Shelley Greenspan, great to have you on our program today and great to have you there in the White House, a nice South Florida connection to the Jewish community. Please do keep in touch with us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. All right. And when we come back, you be the judge when you hear from a judge about a state plan to redo the boundaries of Florida's courts.
under scrutiny at the moment, a plan by the state to merge some of Florida's 20 judicial districts to possibly make prosecutions and trials more efficient. But since all involved in that process, the state's attorney, the public defenders, the judges, they're all elected by local voters. Some suspect political motives, especially since the governor's removed Democratic state's attorney in two counties. Broward Circuit Judge Robert Lee is on that independent committee hearing input about the merge idea and is here in advance of the meeting this week. We have a meeting this it's week. It's actually we next week. Next week. Next okay. week. Welcome to the well, table. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. It's great to have you here. You're a judge. You're very diplomatic. You're very even handed. You're very <laughs> balanced. We're not getting political here, but I just want to, for anybody in our audience who's very engaged audience, that's not really in the weeds with what's happening. I just want to explain that the speaker has, and the, the Supreme Court has convened you and your colleagues to look at merging the 20 districts here and there for efficiency. Correct. Uh, we actually have a rule in place in Florida that requires this to be looked at every seven years. Uh, speaker Renner requested that we take a look at it, uh, in particular to look at uh, money saving possibilities and efficiencies. And, and that gave rise to the Chief Justice's uh, administrative order that he put together for the committee. And so that's what you're doing on face value. Right. We had a Republican Monroe State Attorney, Dennis Ward, here at the table not too long ago talking about why the Keys, the Monroe very small district and Dade's monolithic huge district, the idea of merging that would be ridiculous for the Keys because of the layers of issues trying to prosecute and defend and, and have a court system. Um, but other than that, w do you see an issue so far with what you've seen with the rest of the state? Well, keep in mind, Miami-Dade and Monroe are an interesting uh, example because they are the smallest number of counties involved in a possible consolidation. Ah. The rest of the state is looking at many more counties where it's a possibility. So, but that being said, the furthest north courthouse in Miami-Dade, which is the North Dade Justice Center, if you actually compare that to Key West, you're looking at, a on a good day, a drive of four hours uh, and um, I think 170-something miles if they were consolidated and you said to a judge in the North Dade Justice Center, by the way, uh, we need you tomorrow to go to Key West because there's a, an emergency down there and, and we don't have anyone to handle. So, so we're going to extrapolate, you think that's a bad idea. Well, <laughs> that, I don't, that piece of I, it, I right? think because we're, we're asked to look at 21 different criteria, but at the same time, the counties in the northern part of the state have been doing this for decades because they have four and five counties and in one of our circuits there's seven counties that have been together and they've had to do this transportation issue uh, for, for decades. So they look at it a little bit differently than perhaps we do in South Florida because we have very large populations and very geographically small circuits. Okay, so I, I wanna get down to the committee meetings you've had so far. You've asked for input. Correct. And you've gotten a flood of input. A flood of input. <laughs> and all but maybe a few, which were all state related, the ones I've seen, all but a few of this flood of input said something along the lines of, don't do this. Does that resonate with you in the committee? Well, it has to resonate with us because that is what one of the things we are bound to consider. We also have to consider each circuit's uh, workload, how effective they are in getting their work done compared to their uh, adjoining circuits. So I look at it like we are a jury that is gathering evidence and we have to come up with 20 verdicts for each of our 20 circuits. So it's not a one size fits all. You, you can do for some and not for others. Right, you could say, and I'm gonna make up a 25th and 26th circuit since we don't have them here in Florida. You could say that we believe the 25th should merge with the 28th, but the 26th should stay where it is. Um, you, you can have all those possibilities, but the question in reaching that verdict is, would that consolidation substantially improve, and those are the words in the rule, substantially improve the judicial process? Have you gotten any feedback from anyone or an entity that is in favor of doing this, and why? Because the, if it's, if the, what I'm hearing is if it's not broke, don't fix it, 
And so what is the, what are the proponents, as few as they may be, saying? Okay, we've had a couple of things. The Budget Commission, which came back, the uh, Trial Court Budget Commission came back with some numbers. And they actually also uh, asked the judicial partners, and actually FHP, the Florida Highway Patrol, said they would s save substantial amounts of money by doing, by doing this. That, that was a, min a minority view. We have had some of the uh, counties in the smaller populated area say, we don't have the resources that you have in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville, where you have a veterans court, a mental health court, a DUI d diversion program. It would be nice to have the advantage of some of those programs because our counties are so small, we don't have the population structure to support that. So we are seeing some of that issue being raised. And so the, the committee that will recommend eventually now is meeting three more times. Three more times. And these meetings will be public. They are public. As uh, the, rest, the, the rest invited public input, but no one ever got to watch the, well, the sausage being made. <laughs> they were, uh, four of them were public, you could zoom in, but you could not speak. Then we had two that you could zoom in and speak, and then we had two public hearings that were live. The three remaining are going to be, you may zoom in. I will say the um, email address is uh, flcourts.gov. I, th I think we're going to put that on our website. Okay, and that the is... TV and, TV and website kind talking of, don't go so well. But <laughs> it's important to understand that if you try to zoom in that day, you probably won't be able to because they, they will send you... The link isn't posted. You have to ask for it because of things we have happen in the judicial system often. We have interlopers and inappropriate conduct. Uh, conduct. And so we want to make sure that only the people that are really interested get that. The, the public square can get a little messy. It can get a little <laughs> messy, and we have actually had classes on dealing with how to, uh, how to deal with that as judges. So, you know, I, I know you cannot and will not speak to the politics of it, but, but you acknowledge that there is a, a substantial number of people who think this might be a political move because the state has seen the governor remove two Democrat state's attorney. I, I understand that. I mean, yeah. we hear a lot of that. I will say that this rule has been in place since before this gubernatorial administration. It was also in place before our current chief justice, I believe, was even a member of the Florida Supreme Court. So the rule that says we have to do this every seven years, this is just the first year where the speaker actually asks us, would you take a look at it? And the first year that the state is experiencing this enormous push and pull between partisan forces. And so, um, so you get to be much more in the spotlight than I think you probably planned. Right. <laughs> so Judge Robert Lee, thank you so much. Thank you so um, much for inviting me. Good luck on the committee. Me. You keep in touch with us. And, and we have uh, uh, Miami-Dade's public defender is on the committee. He Carlos sure is. Martinez. And as we mentioned, Dennis Ward, the state attorney in Monroe County, is in the committee. We are well represented. And so we'll be watching what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. And you stay right there. We will be right back. To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan that QR code with your phone and it takes you right where you need to be, the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. You know we love to hear your input, feedback on anything in the news. Find us easily on social media and reach out at Glenna WPLG. That's on Facebook, Twitter, X, and Instagram, and now on threads, wherever you can find us. Thank you so much for being here with us this hour and have a beautiful Sunday.